DNA sequencing is developed by Frederick Sanger, or we can also call it the Sanger Method or Sanger Sequencing. It was a very important breakthrough in the uh, Human Genome Project and actually sped up the entire project by a couple of years and saving a lot and lot of resources and money. And it also actually paves way for uh, future uh, improvements which led to next generation sequencing. In this video, we'll be looking at uh, what we need for DNA sequencing, so in some sense the, in the ingredients, and then actually talking about the process of it. Actually, DNA sequencing is very, very similar to PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it actually uses the same machine, the thermocycler, and a very similar ingredients with one exception. So it will need five things. First of all, it needs the DNA sample that we're actually sequencing and we have lots and lots of free nucleotides and in excess of it, so we can make sure that we uh, sequence everything. Then it also needs something slightly different, which is called the colored fluorescently labeled terminal bases. Uh, we call these terminal bases because um, they are missing a particular oxygen, meaning that once it is added, the DNA strand can no longer continue to uh, extend, but more about that later on. We will also need a DNA polymerase to actually uh, anneal the nucleotides together and also the primer which starts the entire process. So those are the five different ingredients that uh, we can use. For some of you who are doing extra reading or further reading, uh, you will notice that in a lot of articles or online websites, they say that they use something called deoxynucleoside triphosphates or DNTP. Uh, as the instead of the nucleotides and uh, dideoxynucleotide triphosphate, which is DDNTP, uh, instead of the terminator basis, work exactly the same. Don't worry about that. Just think of it as simple nucleotides, and they will be fine. So what we will talk about the process. In the beginning, we've got our DNA strand. Like I said, it's very similar to PCR. So the first step is to heat it up to 95 to 96 degrees Celsius, where we can denature the DNA sample, so it becomes two separate strand. And what we do is we cool it down to 50 degrees Celsius and the primers can then anneal to it. Then we heat it up to 60 degrees this time and the DNA polymerase can start adding the complementary bases to the template strand or at least binding them together. But this is where it is different from PCR. So imagine we've got one of the bases here and uh, normally speaking if it's just normal nucleotides it will just keep adding it on. However in this particular case um, we've got a terminator base adenine added to it. Because terminator bases are missing an oxygen uh, on the third carbon of the uh, ribosugar on the, on the nucleotide, so therefore it cannot form a new phosphodiester bond with the phosphate group of the next um, nucleotide. So therefore, once the terminator base binds to it, it can no longer extend the strand, so it stops there. And let's say in another strand, it's got a normal adenine added on, a normal uh, nucleotide added on, but this time it got a thymine terminator base added to it. Again, same thing, it's missing an oxygen, so it can't form any further phosphodiester bonds, and so it stops there. And the process continues on with other strands, so it will end up, we will end up with something that looks like this. So basically, through this process repeated with many, many different strands, we will end up with a variety of fragments of different lengths. And because we put the nucleotides, the free nucleotides in excess, and there will be less terminator bases than the nucleotides, we can almost guarantee by doing enough cycles, we can make sure we can get strands stopped at almost every single base number. So we will get literally just fragments of different lengths. There's still two ways that we can read the data. Number one is when we do the uh, electrophoresis, uh, we do the southern blotting again and then we get the nylon membrane. And what we can then do is to, uh, because all the, these terminal bases are fluorescently labeled, so what we can then do is to direct the UV light onto the nylon membrane and see what we get. So because the smaller the fragment, the further it travels, the bigger the fragment, the slower it travels. This is where it started, the electrophoresis started. So the smallest one will travel the furthest along and the longest one will be further behind. So what we'll get is a pattern that looks like this. Because uh, the smallest one here is the furthest away, it's all we know that, okay, that must be nearer to the, um, the starting of the gene. So what we then need to do is to, just to read it off from the top to the bottom um, based on where they ranked in the order and that will allow us to generate a sequence ATCGTA 
or another way which is the recent way of doing it is with the laser box here so the laser will direct a beam through um, the gel as the uh, bases actually pass through uh, long so like I said earlier the smallest one will be the first one to enter and the last one will be the last one to go through so but the thing is as it goes through it will generate a pattern on the computer on the bottom you might get the base number which is you know base number one two three four etc and it will generate a pattern that looks like this now as you can see uh, this way you can literally just read off um, as you as you go through so uh, but this time you will notice that uh, obviously as you go through uh, you might get some free nucleotides or you know errors pass through the laser at the same time so we'll get some almost like background signals uh, lower down but you will see you should see a massive spike of each of the individual uh, fluorescents given off by the uh, terminator bases because they are in concentration they are they're concentrated in one band moving together at the same time so it should generate a concentrated signal uh, of the different fluorescent light given off so the, there are just two ways of doing so and all that is left to do is to build the original strand from the data or and if you're using the complementary sequence then you just need to uh, read it uh, the in the complementary way and this is DNA sequencing. Let's do a very quick recap. In the first step, we've got uh, our original DNA sample. We need to heat it up to about 95 degrees Celsius for denaturation. Then we cool it down to 50 degrees, and this is where the primers can anneal together. Then we heat it up again to 60 degrees, uh, where the nucleotides can start building the nutrient and DNA polymerase can actually work, catalyzing the phosphodiester bonds. And in this particular process, uh, the strands can build normally if a normal nucleotide will bind to it. However, if a terminated base binds to it, it will stop further extension because uh, it's unable to form phosphodiester bonds with another nucleotide. What we can then do after a couple of cycles of uh, building up the strands, we can either do gel electrophoresis uh, and then do self blotting and make a, a nylon sheet like that and then put it under UV light so we can read off the strands because the smallest fragments will travel the furthest away because it's fastest and the biggest fragment will be traveling the slowest. We can just read it off from top to bottom. Or if we do capillary sequencing, which is uh, electrophoresis in a minute capillary tube, we can add in a laser, which can then read off the uh, bases or the fragments as it goes through the machine. And then we can generate a computer signal graph like this, and we can then just read it off as it goes through. And this is DNA sequencing.